Today is Curious Creatures of the Sonoran. We are so fortunate today to have Natalie Chase, the Education Programs Developer uh, from the Center for Native and Urban Wildlife. That's at Scottsdale Community College. Uh, Natalie has worked for SNU. I think that's how that's how they how Leona first told me. Says she said SNU, and I said, "What's SNU?" You know, not everybody is so um, hip. But Natalie has worked for I'm sorry, yeah, Natalie's worked for SNU for over 20 years and spends most of her days working with or thinking about the plants and the animals. Natalie is a great friend of the Conservancy and has always supported us on numerous projects. But if you don't like bugs and snakes, then Natalie would be the one that you need to talk to. Our two amazing co-hosts for today's presentation, our legacy steward, Sue Hankey, and master steward, Leona Weinstein. Uh, I'm so proud to be, to be part of this organization. When you, when you look at and talk to these people, when we, Leona said, at one of our Pathfinder orientations. Yeah, I can help you out, I can do this, but look at what she's brought us today. That's just amazing, the, the capability of, our, of our, our, our stewards. Well, Sue has been involved with our Curious Creatures since 2010, when she became coordinator of the newly created Field Institute's Reptile and Amphibian Project. She also was an integral part in the formation of the Nature Guide Program. Leona, I don't know if you got any work in today though, is currently the assistant construction and maintenance chair and, and had the vision of supporting the creation of the preserves phenology program. Both Sue and Leona have spent many years following their passion of educating guests and animal care as volunteers with the Center for Native and Urban Wildlife. I'm so happy to welcome all of them to help educate us and Natalie, um, Nice to meet you. Uh, if you could, uh, uh, there you go. There you go. If you, there's Natalie in the middle, Leona on the left, for those who know, and Sue on the right. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Oh, my oh. pleasure. Nice to meet you, Natalie. Yes, definitely. We are excited to get started today. So I'll have my two partners here to help me. And we are here at the Nature Center at CNU, we call it. Um, it's a nice way to uh, tell people we want to see the desert in a new light. And so our main mission is to get people excited about the Sonoran Desert and to show them ways that they can take um, you know, an active participation in preserving the Sonoran Desert. Um, starting with right in your backyard. So we encourage a lot of native planting and providing habitat for um, urban wildlife. So if you're interested in any of that, we do a lot of um, outreach outreach through uh, fourth grade um, education tours here on site. And we do events you know, with the Conservancy regularly. Um, we always can use extra helpers over here and uh, let me know if you're interested. So uh, I think we're ready to get started. So we're gonna go through a couple different groups of animals. And the first one will be amphibians. So if you picture the Sonoran Desert, um, you probably think of a hot, dry wastelands, maybe some cacti and trees on the landscape. And if you're picturing that image in your mind right now, you're probably not seeing toads hopping across the landscape. Um, and that's because uh, amphibians have a really hard time in the deserts. They, uh, if you look up close here, we've got our first toad. And if you go in really slow, so we don't think you're a predator. <laughs> They've got uh, some shiny skin there, if you can see that reflecting back. So their skin is really permeable. Um, they can lose water pretty easily through that soft permeable skin. And so an amphibian's life cycle is tied to water. So they cannot um, completely dry out. And in order to reproduce, they have to come back to water. And so they're gonna be really restricted in a desert. And so if you think about when you're gonna see an amphibian, it is not gonna start until it is warm and humid. So our monsoon time is really when amphibians shine. And um, you guys have been out there noticing some amphibians on the preserve, I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we have a um, amphibian uh, survey going on right now and you can participate. We've moved from the night to the early morning time. 
So uh, the sign up, there's still some sign ups left and it's on better impact under amphibians. And we'd love to have you join us during one of our outings. Great. So you guys might see um, some of the species we're showcasing today. You have uh, about four species that we've found so far on the preserve. And this first one that we're looking at is called the Sonoran Desert Toad. So this is our little male. And just to kind of give you uh, some scale about how big he is next to a hand, um, the female is back over here. Uh, the Sonoran Desert Toad is the largest toad in North America and they are also the most toxic toad in North America. So a lot of the problems people have here in uh, Phoenix is these toads will live in your backyard. And if you have a dog, um, dogs often will get in there and uh, play with the toads. And if you see right here, this little sausage shaped structure um, is the paratoid gland. And that is where um, the toad manufactures its poison. And if a dog were to come in, you know, and, and try to bite him and mouth on him, you know, the toad will get all upset. He'll try to run away like that. But if the dog gets it, um, a white milky substance will start to ooze out of those glands. And you might see on the leg, there's some other small structures that are glands. Um, and once that goes into the mouth, it gets into the bloodstream pretty quickly and it can cause a dog to go into shock um, or even die. So um, if, if that happens, you know, if you can try to get um, your dog to a hose and hose its mouth out and call poison control. Um, you know, it's not certain death, but it definitely needs medical treatment. Um, so these guys are uh, usually active. They're the first toad I see in the year. Sometimes around May, I'll start seeing them before it even gets very humid. So they're a little bit more tolerant of coming out um, when it's less humid. Um, but they, they hop around at night when it's cool and the sun doesn't burn their skin and they get a little bit more humidity. Um, and they will look around for bugs to eat. Let's see if uh, anybody wants to eat. Um, here at the center, we, we raise the food for them. So they'll eat roaches and crickets and mealworms. And they're usually pretty happy to eat. <laughs> oh, oh, he got dirt. He hates getting dirt in his mouth. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've never seen such picky toads. <laughs> No? There we go. Yay. <laughs> so these are big toads. They have big appetites. Um, when you're the largest toad, you can eat the largest prey. And so they'll happily dine on bugs, but they've also been known to dine on um, small mammals like rodents or um, small reptiles. Anything that they can fit into their mouth is potential dinner. Other toads. Other toads <laughs> even, yeah. And so one of the things we, we might notice patterns is that some of the smaller toads are gonna be more active in the daytime instead of at nighttime when the big toads are out um, to avoid being eaten. Oh, and that's really cute. He's doing his toe twitch because he's excited to get more food. Oh, really? Yeah, see if you can kind of go in. Sure. Let's see if he's gonna do it again. Oh, he might be done. The toe twitch is really cute. So, so yeah, if you guys can kind of, oh, there you go. Get a look at, their eyes are beautiful. And uh, I, I mean, I know not everybody thinks toads are beautiful, but I think that these guys are pretty, pretty neat and they have neat personalities. So you can get to know your backyard toad if you're lucky enough to have one. All right, so we've got uh, a couple other species up here that you see on the preserve. This one is the red spotted toad. And you'll notice um, significantly smaller. Oh, got a little scared. I'm oh, sorry. And he's called the red spotted toad. We'll just take him out here. Because they have red spots on their body. So that's a pretty defining feature. Uh, none of the other toads look at like quite like this, except for, just to confuse us, the Sonoran Desert Toad. When it is very young and first uh, morphs out from a tadpole, it uh, has red spots on its back. So uh, you can learn to tell them apart, but it's a little confusing um, when toads are first metamorphosizing out. Yeah, so one thing you might notice is that the paratoid glands on the red spot are shaped a little differently. So they're kind of round and reddish, and that's a good way to tell which toad you're looking at because if you remember the Sonoran Desert Toad's glands were long sausage kind of shaped. Um, so that's a really easy way to define these guys. Also, if you're looking at eggs or tadpoles in little ponds, um, the red spot toad is the only toad that lays single eggs. 
most of the time toads lay eggs in big strings or clusters. So it's pretty easy to tell if you're looking at red spot toad eggs um, in a pond. And these guys, you know, they're a little more flattened um, in their shape. So they might be found in more like um, rocky canyons or riparian areas where there's little crevices to hide in. Um, and they are also mostly active when it's warm and humid. So this is their time to breed and eat. And then our final guest is the Coach's Spadefoot Toad. And just, uh, just as I'd expect, um, he has disappeared. <laughs> but don't worry, he's not gone. He has just uh, buried. Actually, this one looks like it's a girl. And a very dirty mess here. All right, there you go. So the female Spadefoot Toads have a lot of pretty modeling. Um, and if we had washed her off, you would see that she's bright yellow with some black modeling spots on her. And you might notice how different the eyes are. Um, so I'm get a better yeah. shot, sorry. You want me to hold it over here? Yeah. So the eyes are more cat-like. And um, a neat thing about spadefoot toads is they are in a completely different family than all the other toads we've looked at so far. Um, so some people say they're not a true toad because they're not in um, the bufo family. Uh, but these guys are just slightly different because you'll notice cat-like eye pupils there. And also notice there's no paratoid gland. So these guys do have some skin. Oh, you got to hear a little squeak. So that's a release call because she's not enjoying this moment. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, and that just means put me down. Um, so after I um, handle this spade foot toad, um, it would be wise for me to go wash my hands because the skin has a lot of secretions. Um, amphibians in general have a lot of interesting secretions in their skin that um, help keep infections at bay. So they have antibiotics and all sorts of interesting compounds, as well as some irritants that could get into your eyes and uh, be troublesome. So it's always good to wash your hands after handling amphibians. Um, they also have a tendency to pee on you as a defense mechanism. So uh, expect that if you're ever going to pick up a toad, maybe if you wanna move it out of the road, um, unfortunately, especially our Sonoran Desert Toad um, really likes to. Does he have a spade? Um, yeah, really likes to sit on the road at night to bask, and they tend to get hit by cars are they that doing? way. Yeah. And then, why are they called spadefoot toads? Uh, can you see that little blackened dark spot here on the toe? Right it's there. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. that is the spade, and that is like a hardened part of the foot. It's made out of keratin, so the same thing as our hair and fingernails. And that's just kind of a structure that acts like a little shovel to help dig into the soil so that they can get out of the sunlight um, and into a cool, dark spot. And oh, maybe he's out. Okay. The one guy, <laughs> he jumped <laughs> out. Yeah, we always want to put lids back on. Uh, but if we uh, close up shop here, maybe we'll see that spade foot digging back down, showing a uh, use of the toad. Uh, <laughs> She'll be right back. She's just washing her hands. <laughs> Maybe if we uh, if we walk by over here and it starts dating, we'll go back over and. Uh, and we don't have a great plains toad um, here in the center right now, but uh, just so you see a picture, um, they are a really pretty looking toad with these kind of paisley blotches. Um, and they are also out at night at these um, tanks of water, breeding and eating and doing their toady things. And you might notice it's interesting that they have a spade too, even though they're not related closely to spadefoots. So that has evolved a couple times in toads. Okay, so that was just a quick survey of amphibians. If you wanna see an amphibian, it's probably going to be when the weather's really nice in the morning or towards the evenings when it's humid and they're out looking for a place to breed and eat. Um, but they'll always be breeding in water, laying their eggs. Yeah. Oh, another really cool thing about the spade foot toad is um, the, the time that water stays around in the desert is really limited. So those pools are gonna shrink and shrink and shrink a little every day until it dries up completely. So the spade foot is one of the fastest developing toads in the world. If you were to guess how long does it take to go from an egg laid in water to a tiny little metamorph, what would that number be off the top of your head? You would think maybe it would take a long time, right? Yeah. Spadefoots can do it in eight days. 
You know, they hatch within a day and they go through an entire developmental process to a little toad in eight days if they need to. And that's just to get out of there before the water dries up and they would die otherwise. So it's an amazing feat that they go through. Uh, we don't keep a lot of mammals here, but I did want to make a little quick token stock here. Um, these are probably the two most famous um, big cats we have in the US. You've got the mountain lion here on the right and the bobcat on the left. And the mountain lion is the largest cat in the US. And I think a lot of times people confuse them with a the bobcat. So we have a nice side by side comparison here. So you can kind of look at the differences. Um, size is really obvious, but um, the coat pattern. There's some speckling on the bobcat. The ear tips are really pronounced and a short bobbed tail, um, unlike the mountain lion's long tail. Um, you're probably never going to see these guys out on the trails. Um, our cats are mostly nocturnal and really secretive. And it's really a treat if you do get to see one. Um, hopefully it's not one of those rare, rare, rare cases where a mountain lion it takes interest <laughs> in a human. Um, it's incredibly rare. Um, I think I have an image here. Um, they cause an average of one death a year in the US, uh, but we kill thousands of them. So I think you're probably safe, but always, always you know, watch your back when you're out on the trail in those trees around. So we're going to go over here to um, the group that you might find out in the desert. And this is the desert tortoise. So this is one of our most charismatic species. And these guys were hatched out here at Sinu. And if you were to guess how old they were, you can think about, you know, how long does a tortoise live? How fast do they grow? Um, and you might have a way you could tell how fast or how old a tortoise is. Maybe they count these things. Yeah, so that's a, a lot of the times people will think you can count the rings on a tortoise shell. Um, these are growth rings, similar to like a tree grows. And you can roughly count the rings on a tortoise shell for growth. So I know exactly how old these guys are. They are just about to turn five next month. Okay. So when tortoise hatches, it only has one scoot. These are called scoots, um, one scoot per area. And so this was the hatched scoot when it was first hatched out. So this would be one growth ring. And you can tell they grew a lot that year because it's so wide. Um, one, uh, maybe that's two, kind of gets a little tricky. And then they started growing a little slower, three, four, mm, So let's see, yeah, probably like one, two, three, four. I think we could make five out of that. So it's accurate right now. Um, but once a tortoise starts to hit, you know, 15 years or so old, that counting doesn't work so well. And it may just be because the growth rings slow down. That's when they reach maturity is 15 to 20 and they can start laying eggs and reproducing. Um, and so after that point, it gets really hard to count the growth rings. Um, so their shell is a really neat structure. Um, she can actually feel me touching her through the shell right now. And it's made of, again, keratin, just like our fingernails and hair. And uh, we have a and little have, hole. You actually just jump out of their shell, <laughs> Natalie, and go running like I've seen a cartoon. Yeah, it's a, that's a funny one. Uh, so a tortoise is born with its shell, hatches out with a full shell, and never leaves that shell during its entire life. And that is because... This structure, you can see a little bit right there. Um, underneath that keratin layer is bone, that white part. And then if you can see inside there, I don't know if the angle is good. Yeah. There, up there in the top, can you see a spine? So their spinal cord is fused into the bony part of their shell. All right, so they, they live in this shell. They are part of the shell for their entire lives. You're saying the cartoons were wrong. The cartoons are wrong. <laughs> Not being I know. Right. <laughs> so this would probably be a, a tortoise just about to reach reproductive maturity. Um, it takes them, um, you know, up to 20 years in the wild. They can get there a little faster um, in captivity, like as much as 12 years, because they get so much good food to eat. Um, it's hard to be a tortoise in the desert because they only eat plants. 
and grasses are a huge component of their diet. Um, and so if you think about when is it lush and green in the Sonoran deserts? And if it's been really dry, like it has the last, I don't know, what are we up to 20 years now of just terrible <laughs> uh, monsoon patterns, um, it gets harder and harder for a tortoise. So they will um, gorge during the spring, hopefully when we've had winter rains to fuel lots of grasses and plants growing. And in the summertime, tortoises don't really like to be out in the heat. Tortoise is kind of at its limit for the, um, being in a desert. They don't really have a high heat tolerance. Someone asked how thick the shell is. On oh yeah, so that's a, a good question. So when they first hatch, it's so soft that you can kind of like squeeze the tortoise a little bit and it gives. Um, and that's because, you know, they've been in a shell and they're, they're young and this is all having to harden. And so predation rates can be really high um, on a young tortoise because that shell isn't really hard like an adult would be. And so in terms of thickness, you know, it's it varies where I put my fingers, but like something like that at a thick point. Um, on the top. Yeah. Yeah. So so this is where it really wants that that defense to be in there. Because when a tortoise reaches this size, pretty much its only predator is going to be like a mountain lion that could get its jaws around the shell and crunch it. Um, sometimes coyotes will try to go after um, legs and stuff. A tortoise can't actually um, fully retract inside of its shell like a tortoise. Someone asked about um, a box turtle. Are yes. they are they um, the same? Different? How? <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> turtle, the, tortoise. turtle tortoise question comes up a lot. It's confusing. <laughs> and what I usually tell people is um, all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. Are no tortoises. No turtles are tortoises. Like, no, it's a little liquid. <laughs> so the, the whole entire group are turtles and tortoises are a subset out of that group. And that um, that subset is the guys that have the big stout elephant like legs. And you can tell that this is a leg met for digging. It's got some strong claws um, and really strong legs. And if if I want to scare them a little bit, they, they don't care. They don't they don't find me threatening enough. Um, <laughs> cooperate. So he doesn't even want to put his legs in. Um, so if somebody were trying to eat him, he could withdraw his legs, not going to do it, and pull, <laughs> and pull his head in. But the legs can't completely disappear. But all you'll see is this rough, rough scaled part of um, the leg sticking out. So pretty good defense against most animals in the desert. Um, the one defense they don't seem to have against is humans. And so if there are vehicles driving in the desert, um, you know, that's a really high risk for tortoises, off-roading vehicles, things like that. Um, you know, and we're, we're just changing their habitat a lot. So if we're, you know, cutting off their habitat and they need big migratory corridors, you know, as they go around um, their summer and their winter patterns, you know, cutting those off can really affect tortoises. So uh, picking them up. Uh, yeah. And so this guy was hatched here and, you know, we have a permit to keep them because they are protected by state law. It's a very special species um, and potentially um, leaning towards an endangered species. In um, California, it's an endangered species and they have now broken them up into three um, subspecies. So California has the Mojave Desert Tortoise. Um, we have the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. And then there's a third type that's in Mexico. Um, and so each of those will probably end up with protection. Someone asked about the urination if they're picked up. Yes. And so I keep looking down because I'm like, oh, it's going to drop in. <laughs> so oftentimes tortoises aren't meant to leave the ground and fly through the air. And so it might be a little upsetting to, for them. And so if they're if they're leaving the ground, it's probably because a predator is is trying to dig them up and eat them. And so for whatever reason, a tortoise's defense other than its shell is to pee. And so um, that's a really big problem for a tortoise because they store their reserve water in their bladder. As much as 40% of their body weight can be water stored in the bladder. And they can pull on that water through the long, hot, dry summer and use that. Uh, so if you've upset a tortoise enough to make it pee, A, you should never pick up a wild tortoise because it's against the law. But B, for biological reasons, they may void their bladder on you and um, not have that reserve anymore. And we know that we can go three, four, five months without it raining. And that's really the only chance they have to refill their bladder. So we never wanna pick up a wild tortoise unless it's in an incredibly dangerous situation, like it's on a busy road. And at that point, I would gently and slowly intervene. Um, 
that you're not really going to see desert tortoises out in the wild because they're really only active a little window during the spring. Maybe two weeks out of the entire year, um, they might be active. And that's just because they don't like the hot, dry weather. They're going to come up, eat, and then be back in bed by the time the sun is getting hot. Um, but the burrows that they live in are so important because um, there aren't a lot of animals that have those big digging legs that can make deep burrows. So we call them a keystone species because they are so key and instrumental in providing shelter for other animals in the desert that use those burrows, whether the tortoise is in them or not. Sometimes you find weird bedfellows and tortoise um, burrows like a heel monster. We've seen rattlesnakes. <laughs> rattlesnakes. Yeah. yeah, none of them seem to care. They're just all in there to get out of the heat. Um, but that's a really important service that they provide in the desert. And that's why they're such an important species. Um, oh, and well, let's go take a quick peek at another tortoise that we have here. <laughs> and this little one um, came to us recently. Oh, really small. Yeah. And this one is um, a fresh hatchling. So I'll let you just to oh. get a get a side by side comparison of how small she is, and you can see one scoop, no growth rings, and that's about how small they are when they hatch out. Oh, very cool. She's got she's got 80 more years of life in her, hopefully. You know, that's about how long you expect them to live in captivity. In the wild, it might be closer to 50. All right. So, oh, since we're here, we'll take a peek at the next group we're going to look at, the lizards. All right. So lizards and tortoises are reptiles versus the amphibians that we, fir we first talked about. Um, this is a tiger whiptail, uh, one of the most common whiptails out there. This is the only one that we've documented have, in the preserve. Okay, yet. so you only have the tiger whiptail on the preserve. Um, and you can kind of see they've got some neat pattern um, on their back there. Very fast ground dwelling lizard that you might just see zip across the trail. Um, we also have over here the most common lizard that you'll see out on the preserve. He's right here oh. having a little bask in the sun. Oh. And I'm going to upset him a little bit, I think. Let's see. Oh, he's, he's tolerating it. Okay. So this is a side blotch lizard. I'm going to try to, there we go. Show him your side. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Not very <laughs> So they're called the side blotch lizard because they have a big old blotch on the side behind the armpit there. Is it coming out? Is you it black? It? Right, yep. Right. It's a black oh, yeah, armpit. I see it. Yeah. Well, so that's how you can identify. <laughs> Also very fast and small, so you're probably not going to have time to identify them, but if you, if you're going to see those you'll mostly see those. when they're on the rocks and yeah. running across the trail. <laughs> it's usually one of, okay. the, yeah, one of the um, side blotch. This is another species of tiger whittail that you don't have on the preserve, but these guys are so cool. We'll just take a minute to talk about them. It's called the Sonoran spotted whiptail. Um, I think we have something like a dozen species of whiptail in Arizona. And this one is especially cool because there is never a male um, Sonoran spotted whiptail. The species arose from the hybridization of two different types of whiptail and um, became their own distinct species out of that hybridization. And they reproduce by cloning themselves. Um, so all female, all genetically, almost 100% genetically duplicates of each other. And we're on our like, I don't know, fourth or fifth generation of little baby clones. Oh, there's a little one out there. <laughs> so just a super cool fact uh, that can happen with whiptails. A couple different species are parthenogenic like that. Uh, so we'll come over here and we'll meet uh, one of our most charismatic lizards. This is a chuckwalla. And chuckwallas are our second largest lizard in the Sonoran Desert. And we, <laughs> this guy is not very large. We call him Chico. Um, he, he's a little on the small side, but he's working on it. And we've had Chico, uh, let's see, 2013. So yeah, he's getting kind of old. Um, Chuck Wallace can make it easily into their twenties. So they're in the iguana family, pretty long lived for a lizard. And if you want to see a wild Chuck Walla, you have to go to a very specific habitat type. And that is where there is big, like bouldery, rocky areas. Um, cause they like to sit out on rocky outcrops and, um, the males have territories and they guard them very violently. <laughs> so we might, uh, we might go over here and see if Chico wants to say hi to Carrot, our other male Chuckwalla. See if they. 
So um, you might notice Carrot over here is colored a little differently than Chico. Um, he is a carrot tail Chukwala. Same species, but um, carrot tails are only found in South Mountain and nowhere else in the world. Um, it's a neat, unique isolated population um, that developed a different color pattern than every other Chukwala. So it's pretty neat if you want to go down to South Mountain and see a carrot tail. Got a beautiful black back and an orange tail. Um, let's see, do they want to say hi? So reptiles don't communicate vocally, but they do communicate oh, through body language. Push up. So we're getting some push-ups. Chico really wants to get in there and pick a fight. <laughs> so you're seeing oh, oh, no. you're seeing some oh, oh. <laughs> We're seeing some male territorialism there. Yeah, really hard to do a show with kids <laughs> or animals. <laughs> and the push-ups are simply a way of communicating, this is my space, you better get out of here or there's going to be a fight. And if Chico decides that the push-ups weren't enough of a warning, then they will actually go into a fight with biting and alligator death rolling to try to tear toes off. It's, it can be pretty violent. But the push-ups are like a way to hopefully avoid that. A lot of people say they see lizards out there doing push-ups on a rock yep. or on their fence. Yep. And so that that's a form a, of communication of like, this is my space. Um, you probably shouldn't come over here. I mean, it may mean more than that, but that's our main interpretation. <laughs> I don't speak lizards. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Natalie. I'm sorry, what? No, Natalie, we had a question about the Chuck Wallace uh, as far as their growth pattern. And now the, I see the two different sizes. Uh, is, is it correlated to in the wild to the amount of rainfall and plant growth? Yeah, so let's go ahead and talk about that because um, what you're gonna eat after just getting into a fight. Um, Chuck Wallace eat vegetation. Um, they are an herbivore um, and plants are all they eat. And so, oh, there we go. Chico's really excited for his salad today. Um, they love flowers, leafy greens. Um, they've got a lot of moisture um, in those materials. And so just like a tortoise, being a chuckwalla is really hard in the desert because if it doesn't rain, plants don't grow as lush. Um, they, they don't flower, they don't leaf out. And so it can be harder to find food when it's dry. But when it's wet um, and we're getting a lot of rain, the plants grow really well and the chuckwallas eat really well. Um, so this year should be a really good year for chuckwallas. And they uh, store extra fat in their tail base. So you can see, um, you can kind of squish some fattiness there and in their back legs here. So when they, um, when they get a lot to eat, they'll store fat in their body. And if next year we don't get a good monsoon, they can live off of their fat reserves. Um, so hopefully they get enough rain you know, throughout the years to, to keep some body mass on and grow. Um, you might notice also that Chico's got a lot of flab, and that's not because, you know, he's lost a lot of weight. Um, he's got a lot of wrinkles right there. So this is a Chukwala's main defense mechanism. They live in those crevices in those rocky areas. And if something like a coyote were to run up and try to eat Chico, um, he would dive into his rocky crevice and start gulping air, and his body would puff up like a balloon. And how can that possibly help him looking like a balloon? Maybe it makes him look larger. Um, that could be part of it. But also if he's in that crevice and he's inflating, now he's wedged in really tight and the, the coyote can't dig him out and get to him. So other than potentially biting back, you know, a chuckwalla will tail whip and try to keep the predator away by hitting them, um, biting them or just hiding in, in, in a crevice. So between a lot of people that the uh, Gila monsters oh, yeah. and the Chukwala is a little bit yeah. mixed up. I think a lot of times people see a Chukwala and think they've seen a Gila monster. And let's go look at how some okay. they are. Is there something in there we need to, do we need to close oh, yeah. that? Okay. Um, so this is a model of a Gila monster that we have. And I'll put Chico in here side by side so you can kind of see how they look. So they both have some bright colors on the red to pink scale um, to peach. Gila's can range from peach to pink. Um, but you'll notice that the Gila's have banding. And actually, if you look up at this poster here, you can see there are two color patterns for Gila Monster. There's the reticulated, and then there's the banded. Um, and so the model that we have down here is the banded type. And the Gila Monster is our largest lizard um, in the desert here. 
So they're close in size. They've got some similar colors, but that's where the similarities really end um, because Gila monsters are carnivores. They're nest raiders, so they eat babies, baby quail eggs, um, baby rodents in the nest. Um, and Gila monsters are venomous, unlike chukwalas. So if you were to be bit by a Gila monster, um, here's a skull model showing their teeth. It's gonna be a pretty painful bite, but it's also gonna be a venomous bite. So how many people do you think Gila monsters kill every year? Five. Five, that'd be a good guess. But there's actually <laughs> <laughs> millions. Um, there's actually no recorded death ever by a Gila monster. And so you might wish you were dead because um, the bite is very painful. They don't have an injection system like a rattlesnake does to deliver the venom. They have like a salivary gland um, back here in the, in the jaw. And the venom has to kind of travel out and leak up through grooves in the teeth into the wound. And so they're gonna bite and they're gonna grind and they don't usually let go. Um, but I always tell people, you don't have to worry about Gila monsters. If you got bit by a Gila monster, it's because you asked for it. Um, it's you, because you tried to touch it. Um, they don't lunge out of bushes and grab your ankle as you're walking by. And they'll give you plenty of warning um, that they are there. They'll hiss, they'll run away. Um, but a Gila monster is also protected in Arizona. It's one of our very unique special species, um, only found in the Sonoran Desert. And um, you know, I think you should, if you see one, you're so lucky because just like the desert tortoise, they're only active when the temperatures are nice and they uh, spend most of their time in a burrow um, just kind of waiting out the bad weather. So if you get to see one, enjoy that as a very special treat and leave that yield monster alone. <laughs> Natalie, what's the life expectancy of a uh, chuckwalla and a Gila well, monster? So the, as best we know, um, the chuckwallas can make it into their 20s or even longer if they're lucky. And about the same for a Gila monster, 20s to 30s, um, if they're fortunate enough to make it that long in the wild. In captivity, yeah. easily into their 20s. Someone also asked, why are we seeing so many Gila monsters this year in the preserve? Yeah, and a lot of that is probably going to be the rain. So a Gila monster's motivation for coming out of its burrow onto the surface is going to be to eat um, and to drink. Um, they store fat in their tails, just like the chuckwalla does. And so if there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of plants, there's a lot of seeds, there's a lot of rodents. And that's one of the specialties that Gila monsters eat um, and also quail, things like that. So they've got a lot of babies to go out there and vacuum up in that little window that they have to be surface active. So you'll see them a lot more have nice weather and lots of rain. Okay. Uh, so if we have time, we'll make a pit stop over here in my favorite place, Bugland. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you guys might be surprised. Um, all the animals we've covered so far, that's kind of like what you think of when you think of a desert, right? Like snakes and lizards. Um, but most of our biodiversity in the Sonoran Desert and even in the world is bugs. Um, so some crazy number like 97% of all life on earth is smaller than a human finger. And so the stuff that we really fixate on, you know, the cute, fuzzy, charismatic mammals really isn't representative of all the life that we have out there. And bugs form, um, you know, really important relationships and do important services for us. So I always like to take a minute to stop and talk about them. And we'll look at this one right here. Okay. So this time of year when it's monsoony and cool at night, um, you oh, might really see yeah. tarantulas crawling around. Oh okay. Get a good view of her. So this is the uh, Arizona Desert Blonde. You got a good angle there? You want me to move it? Yeah. Good? No, it's good. Okay. Yeah, and this is a female. Females generally are bigger abdomens. So you can, this part right here is the abdomen. Males tend to have little skinny abdomens and really long legs. And if you're seeing tarantulas at night, it's almost likely going to be a male. Um, they're the ones that are out roaming around looking for mates. And the females are more reasonable and stay close to their burrow and uh, only venture out if they think they can grab a bite to eat. Um, they do spend a lot of time in their burrows, uh, mostly coming out at night to hunt. What's our defense? <laughs> yeah. Which I ask. <laughs> <laughs> so um, spiders in general, almost all of them are venomous, but there are really only a few species that are medically significant to humans. 
Um, so tarantulas are venomous and a venomous bite is a defense. Um, how many people do you think tarantulas kill every year? Nobody. No. <laughs> yeah, you, you might be detecting a pattern here. <laughs> yeah, so zero recorded death of tarantula bite. Um, and the really the only reason you need to worry is if you have an allergic reaction to the venom. And so just like bee stings, you know, you may have some sort of allergic reaction to a bite. But I mean, if you get bit by a tarantula, you probably asked for it. So, um, <laughs> they're not lunging out and chasing you down. So do you want to thank it? Yeah. And then the other, uh, yeah, if you really want to get in there, the other major defense a tarantula has has to do with that abdomen. And you notice how hairy it is. And it's got a bald spot. And it's got a little bald spot. So tarantulas have these special barbed hairs called urticating hairs on their abdomen. And if something like a coyote, they're always making the trouble, um, comes up into the tarantula's business and tries to eat it, the tarantula will take those back legs and rub it over the abdomen and just go flick. And a cloud of hairs will come up into the coyote's face. And those barbed hairs are quite reminiscent of like choya, aren't they, Sue? <laughs> yes, I had one urticating hair in my knee once. <laughs> and we worked so hard to pull that out and got it out and looked under a microscope. And this is what we saw. They are barbed like this. And uh, Natalie said, yeah, that, that was a tarantula hair that you had in your knee and uh, I swear then I had tarantulas growing in my knee for, for <laughs> well, many days. Maybe, maybe not quite that far but <laughs> it was it, a little freaky. <laughs> it's a pretty good defense mechanism um, when you're a, a little spider that's a tasty snack. Um, so yeah always always use caution when um, even just being in a tarantula tank because those hairs can go around. So one of the fun monsoon bugs that you might see out there right now, out of many, but we'll move on because we've got to cover our snake. <laughs> so it sounds like we've got a noisy snake in this bag, maybe. Ooh, <laughs> what you got in the bag, Natalie? Well, the most common snake that you're going to see on the preserve is probably the Western Diamondback, mm -hmm. right? Yes. That's the most common. Yeah. And here is one. <laughs> no. <laughs> so this is um, what he hopes you think is a Diamondback rattlesnake, but is actually a gopher snake. Um, so this is Merlin. He's he's lived with us for quite a few years now, but he still doesn't like us. So, <laughs> um, so he'll tolerate us for a little bit. But you can see the pattern of a gopher snake is roughly like a diamond. Here's a side-by-side here's side side comparison of a beautiful diamondback skin. Um, so for most animals don't have as good a vision as humans. So from afar, even like a hawk up in the sky, those might look pretty similar. And then you'll notice the pattern changes on the tail. And that could really look similar to the rattle pattern um, that a rattlesnake has at the end. And so this is a great form of visual mimicry, but they also do behavioral mimicry of rattlesnakes. So let's go over here and look at that. So if you were just glancing on the trail and you wanted to know which snake you were looking at, you could see um, some cues like, is the body round and shiny? Or is it kind of chunky and flattened and dull? because um, the rattlesnakes look a little different from a gopher snake from afar. Um, if you can see the tail with the rattle, that's the dead giveaway, that kind of coon tail color. Um, but also look at the head shape. You know, uh, this gopher snake barely has a neck. Um, but if you look at a rattlesnake up close, you see they have a very triangular shaped head compared to the gopher snake. And that is because they have, um, they are pit vipers. They have um, special organs in there that help them see at night in infrared. And the gophers aren't equipped with that kind of technology. So um, that's kind of some good indicators. The other things that help you tell the difference, I wouldn't recommend that you get close enough to see, you know, like the pits or the cat-like pupils. Um, so now that you're kind of familiar with the differences between a gopher and a rattlesnake, do you guys think you can tell which one this is? Is that a guess? Trying to get it. I know. That's the, right up here. The glare. Mm -hmm. So you see that nice. I don't know. It kind of looks like <laughs> nice triangular head. It looks like a rattlesnake. It's snake. coiled, getting ready to strike. What well, is this it? this is actually just oh. a gopher snake, 
um, doing a masterful form of behavioral mimicry. So they will um, flatten their heads out. They can just kind of squish it and make it more triangular. And they do this really cool thing where they make a, a hissing sound in their mouth that sounds a lot like a rattlesnake. And they'll take their little tail and they'll beat it against the ground. So it actually looks like they are making the rattle. Like the rattle? Yeah, <laughs> like this. So the rattlesnake's rattle is just a bunch of keratinized, um, they call them buttons. Um, you might think that you could count how old a rattlesnake is by counting the buttons, but that's another one that's probably just not a good way to go because these break off all the time. And, um, um, but a baby will have one button, so you know you've got a one-year-old. Um, another really common question that we get is, are baby rattlesnakes more venomous than adult rattlesnakes? And the answer is, um, would you rather have something this big bite you or this big bite you? How much venom do you think each one has loaded in their, their glands? And the answer is the adult can carry a lot more venom, um, but the babies might be a little more high strung, more skittish, less experienced. And so they might be more inclined to bite and deliver venom. Um, you'll probably be surprised to learn that about 20% of rattlesnake bites are called dry, where they don't deliver any venom. Um, so why would a rattlesnake bite and not envenomate? Well, um, you might be surprised to know that rattlesnakes are not out there to murder every human, like people seem to think. <laughs> They're actually pretty terrified of um, people and potential predators. And when they bite with venom, it can take them as much as two weeks to remanufacture a full supply of venom. And the venom is how they catch their prey and subdue their prey. So they do a really quick bite with venom, and then they stand back and they wait for their prey items um, to be affected by that venom to the point where they just kind of lay down and die. So it's really not worth it um, for them to be biting humans all the time. So um, we had another interesting question about garlic. Can you use garlic as a snake defense, um, a deterrent? And um, my thought is probably not, um, even though it's probably not a pleasant smell, I was just gonna see how Merlin likes garlic. I think he might like Italian food. Oh, it smells. He's, he's like it out. He doesn't seem to matter that um, he's sitting right next to a clove of garlic. So I would say there probably aren't a lot of gimmicks like that that you could use to deter rattlesnakes. Um, if you're really um, snake shy and you want to avoid any potential accidental bites, um, I would recommend getting a pair of gaiters, which are like a hard um, leg sheath that you can wear over your pants. And just be snake smart, which means don't put your hands in your feet where you can't see them. So go around bushes with a pretty good um, opening. Don't put your hands in rock crevices, you know, because they're sitting there minding their own business. We walk by probably hundreds of snakes every time we go hiking on a trail and they sit there and mind their own business and want nothing to do with you. So accidents happen, but it's really rare and less than 1% of rattlesnake bites end in death. Um, if you get to a medical facility quickly, you have pretty good chances and a much smaller pocketbook because <laughs> treating a bite is very, very expensive to get the anti-venom. So I think That's we're it. probably at about time. So what is the most dangerous? No, oh, the most dangerous. Because, you know, you're talking about venom. Yeah. Uh, with venomous. Yeah. And, and, and venomous. there's yeah. all these like, oh, how many people do they kill? Nobody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's let's pull out the most dangerous animal in the Sonoran Desert. Okay. I'm going to, I got it in this box. So oh, I'm no. just going to, I'm, I'm going to be a little nervous. And I'm going to stick my hand in here. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh Thanks, Leona. That was perfect. <laughs> so it's it's a honeybee, um, or just the bees and the wasps and the ants in general. And that is, like I mentioned before, um, people can have allergic reactions to them. And it's just enough of a percentage of people that have that reaction to push those numbers up really high. And plus, we're having problems with things like Africanized bees, and they're overly aggressive, unnecessarily aggressive, I would say. And so if you're not even really close to a hive, they may come after you and sting you. Um, so you might be interested to learn that honeybees aren't even native to North America. We have lots, we have oh, over a thousand species of bee that are native to the Sonoran Desert. We're one of the hot spots in the world for bee diversity, um, but none of them are sting problems like the honeybee is. We have a lot of people talking about the swans in the preserve. Mm -hmm. What should they do if they see it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the swarms aren't dangerous. So the swarm is when a queen and part of the hive are breaking off and starting a new colony. 
And so they're not in defensive mode. Um, the reason honeybees sting is because they're guarding honey and they're guarding eggs and babies in their nest in the queen. And so when a swarm is mobile like that, they don't have those things to worry about so much. So you'll hear a big cloud of them come overhead. And I usually just kind of like sit and wait and enjoy it because it's really interesting to experience. Um, but it's when you're near a hive is when the danger level goes up. And at that point, I would just let everybody know there's a hive over here, avoid that area. Natalie, uh, recently in uh, just north of Tucson, we heard of uh, a bee attack. Are you familiar with that one? Uh, I haven't, but it's really regular that it happens, unfortunately. Okay, but you there were circumstances. No, I don't. But one person had died. Yeah. So unfortunately, it happens, um, and there's not a whole lot we can do because honeybees are feral now in the environment. So yeah. Mm. So you assume that it's a honeybee that would would uh, make yeah rather than yeah. an Africanized. Uh, yeah, our native bees are almost all solitary, meaning they don't form colonies. Um, there's no queen, there's no larvae, there's no honey. Um, they just have a female that mates with a male and then um, would make um, a nest in a little crevice. Um, so something like this can provide homes for native bees. So you might see um, leaf cutter bees um, in your yard. Uh, I don't have a picture of that right now. Um, but they might, you might see a little bee carrying um, a little piece of flower or greenery and then going into like a little crevice, like your window crack or your patio furniture. That's one of our native leaf cutter bees. And she just lays an egg, provisions it with pollen and nectar and leaves. And so it's so rare to be stung by a native bee that I won't even consider it a problem. So we always encourage people provide habitat for our native bees because they're amazing pollinators. They're not dangerous. And they're really neat and diverse creatures to watch. We had a we had a hive over in Brown's Ranch area on on a couple trails where they merged, where they weren't bothering anything, but they looked like they were digging in the ground. Their hive was in the ground. Um, I know John Parenti had taken the photos of the video of that. Uh, it seemed kind of unusual. Is that is that typical to see them in the ground? Uh, not necessarily. Usually they'll like rocky crevices where there's a little bit cooler temperatures and there's water nearby. It's yeah. possible that they had found a crevice that was kind of low to the ground and they might have been excavating a little bit to get that opening. Um, but yeah, they, they're generally not ground nesters, uh, honeybee. 90% or something like 75%, something like that, of our native bees are ground nesters, though. So if you see one bee coming in and out of a hole, then that's probably our native bee. Yeah. Yeah, we have quite a few uh, over the years in Browns Mountain where they do, we do find the hives in the crevices. Yeah, it's, it's probably perfect conditions and they'll always be setting up shop there. Any um, other questions? And does anybody else have any questions? Open mic. I think you've been pretty thorough. It's been amazing. And uh, if there are no more questions, I didn't have any other previous questions. Uh, I just want to say you guys are amazing. Leona, your camera work was beyond spectacular. Um, Sue, thank you for all you do. And Natalie, can, can people come into uh, Scottsdale Community College and see new, now that I know how this see new is, um, can they come in for tours? Can we bring people for tours? How does that work? Yeah, time, times have been a little weird lately, as I'm sure you all know. Um, but I think that they have lifted enough of the restrictions on campus that we're calling ourselves open. And if you just want to email me ahead of time to make sure that we're here for visitors, we love, you know, bring your grandkids, bring visitors from out of state. Um, we keep these animals here as ambassadors to help people learn about how amazing Sonoran Desert Biodiversity is. And if they're not meeting people, then they're not doing their jobs. So yeah, bring people. Great. Great. Yes, no, it's, it's really important that our stewards uh, understand what, what, what they can communicate to, to the visitors and for us to better understand. And you've done an amazing job today. I so much am glad to have met you. And again, I, I'm, I'm so proud of our stewards, of all the work they do in, in educating us. Uh, everyone have a great day. And I'll, September 9th will be the next program with uh, the visions of the future for the, of the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. What's the what's the snake's name? Merlin. Merlin. Merlin, the magician. <laughs>
Again, everybody, <laughs> thank you. The so King Arthur, the King Snake. So, <laughs> we're calling Thanks, Natalie. Great I, remem I remember. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Where's, where's thank Leona? You. We want to see Leona. Oh, I'm so right here. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> well done, you guys. Excellent. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks, Natalie. Everyone's, everyone's saying. Bye.